Amen. You may be seated. Paul David Tripp, uh, pastor and author, uh, he wrote this, God's plan is to make his invisible presence and his invisible grace visible through his people who incarnate his presence and carry his grace to others. We are God's people by God's grace through our faith in Christ Jesus. God is at work in each one of us, making us more and more like Jesus on a day-by-day basis. God wants his invisible work in us to be visible through us. God wants us who know his grace to show his grace. God wants us who know his kindness to show his kindness. God wants us who know his love to show his love. God wants us who know his mercy to show his mercy. God wants us who know his peace to show his peace. Don't ignore, don't doubt, don't miss this important truth. God chooses to do his extraordinary work in and through us. Paul told us about this when he said, For by grace are you saved through faith, And this is not of yourselves, this is a gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God has prepared ahead of time for us to do. We are saved for good works. We are not saved by good works. We are saved for good works. We bring glory to God as we do good works for God. We are blessed by God as we do good works for God. We point people to God as we do good works for God. We grow in our faith in God as we do good works for God. God's invisible work in us is made visible through us as we do the good works that he has prepared ahead of time for us to do. Open your Bibles with me to Acts chapter 2. We're going to continue looking at these good works that God wants us to do in his name for his fame, honor, and glory. We are continuing in our sermon series titled Fit Faith We are looking at and learning from the example of the believers in the first church in Jerusalem. Their faith was fit. They serve as a wonderful example for us to follow today. We are identifying the spiritual godly disciplines that God wants us to either make, renew, or increase in our lives so that our faith can continue to be fit so that we can continue to make God's invisible work in us visible through us. The first discipline that we've talked about is that we're to be biblical. Luke wrote in Acts 2.42, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. These believers in this church gave themselves to the apostles' teaching and preaching of the truth of God's word. God wants us to devote ourselves to the preaching and teaching of his word. God wants us to devote ourselves to reading his word, studying his word, memorizing his word, obeying his word, and sharing his word with those around us. The second discipline that we started focusing in on last Sunday is to be relational. Luke wrote in verse 42, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching to the fellowship. These believers gave themselves to the fellowship. Fellowship means community. It means partnership. It means sharing. It means to have in common with. They had a partnership, community. They share 
new life, abundant life, eternal life with God in Christ Jesus. They devoted themselves to the fellowship. That means they devoted themselves to one another. They devoted themselves to the church family. And God wants the same for you and me because we have new, abundant, eternal life with God in Christ Jesus. And that draws us together as family in Jesus. The apostles' teaching helps us understand the truth of God's word. The fellowship is where God has designed us to live out the truth of his word. We're biblical, then we're relational. We take the truth and we live the truth. So the fellowship is where we live out this truth. As we said last Sunday, God wants us to be grounded and surrounded. Grounded in his word and surrounded by his people. And we know that our fellowship is first and foremost with God, then with one another. Vertical comes before the horizontal relationships in our lives. Our vertical relationship with God is first. And God obviously then wants us, as we devote ourselves to the fellowship, to be biblical in that. He wants us to rely on his word in our relationships. You see, we put God's truth into action within God's team. And so we're learning the word and we're living the word with one another. Therefore, the more we know the truth of God's word, the more effective we can be as members of God's team. The more we know the truth of God's word, the more effective we can be as husbands. The more we know the truth of God's word, the more effective we can be as wives. The more we know the truth of God's word, the more effective we can be as parents. The more we know the truth of God's word, the more effective we can be as employers and employees. The more we know the truth of the word, the more God's invisible work is made visible through us. And so our fellowship, this amazing fellowship, that we see here in Jerusalem that these believers shared with one another was a huge blessing to them. Our fellowship, our fellowship here with one another as brothers and sisters in Christ is a huge blessing to us. And we experience, we embrace, we enjoy this fellowship in many different ways. We do it corporately as we're doing now, We do it in big groups as we did last, this past weekend in our men's conference, as we do on Wednesday nights with our men's ministry and our women's ministry. We do it as well and in a most personal way and more than likely without question all of the Lord's work in us is effective, but one of the most effective ways that we enjoy embrace this fellowship is in our life teams. It's in those small groups that meet together on Sunday mornings and on Sunday nights and during the week. These small groups, these life teams get together for community, for encouragement, to minister to one another, to study God's word. Being biblical is the priority of those fellowships, those life teams. And then we live it out by ministering to one another praying for one another, supporting one another, whatever the needs that may arise, those life teams, small groups. That's where the fellowship, the large fellowship, meets together in small fellowship groups to do life together, to put the truth into action within the team. The late pastor and author Dietrich Bonhoeffer, in his book Life Together, he said this, It is a grace, nothing but grace, that we are allowed to live in community with Christian brothers and sisters. I love that quote. I agree with him wholeheartedly. It is a gift of God's grace that we get to be a part of God's family together. Amen? It's a gift of God's grace that we get to have fellowship with God and with one another. It's a gift of God's grace that we get to come together week in and week out, on Sundays, on Wednesdays, throughout the week, in all of our different relationships and fellowships. It is a gift of God's grace to us. As we were sharing this past weekend in our men's conference, one of God's greatest gifts to us is us. 
One of God's greatest gifts to us is a fellowship of brothers and sisters in Christ is our fellowship as brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus. And so we continue with Luke as he's sharing about being relational. Being relational is going to focus in here as we look now. We're focusing in on our fellowship. Being relational will have different perspectives. There's the inner perspective. That's within our fellowship. And that's where Luke, inspired by the Holy Spirit, went first. But we see also in this passage that that fellowship's also going to have an outward perspective to it that we'll get to as well. But we're still looking at the inward perspective to our fellowship. We're continuing on with what God was speaking to us last Sunday as we make our way through this passage in this series. And Luke wrote, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. So these believers, these brothers and sisters in Christ, they gave themselves to the breaking of bread and to prayer. I believe God wants us to identify. He wants us to see. He wants us to understand so that we can live it out. He wants us to understand this truth so that we can put it into practice in our lives. He wants us to see three important points about fellowship. These three points were true of this Jerusalem fellowship. God wants these three points to be true of our church fellowship. I believe they are. I believe God wants us to continue to increase and enhance and to embrace and enjoy and to share them more and more. These are three key points, vitally important points for you and for me. So let's look at these points here that we see in this passage in Luke 42. And then as we look and he plays it out in verses 43 uh, through 47. The first is food is a part of fellowship. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. Food is a part of fellowship. Look at what Luke said. They devoted themselves to the breaking of bread in verse 42. Look down to verse 46. Every day they devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple and broke bread from house to house. They ate their food with joyful and sincere hearts. These folks enjoyed eating meals together a lot. They were in one another's homes, in one another's pantries, in one another's cabinets. They knew their way around each other's homes. They were eating together. Now, these meals Every day from house to house, these meals, the breaking of bread, included family meals, it included friendship meals, no doubt it included small group meals as these believers gathered together in homes, as we know there was the temple area, but the church in many respects met in the homes of these members spread out throughout Jerusalem, but these meals also included the Lord's Supper. There's also a reference to the discipline of the Lord's Supper for us. Within our fellowship, within being relational with God and one another, within the fellowship that we also observe the Lord's Supper. Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper as he enjoyed a Passover meal with his disciples before his crucifixion. Jesus commanded his disciples then, which includes us today, to eat of the bread and to drink of the cup in remembrance of him. And they obeyed. At that moment, the disciples weren't quite sure how that was all going to play out because they weren't tracking completely with Jesus as he was talking to them about his death, burial, and resurrection that was soon to come. And yet, nonetheless, Jesus commanded them, which falls to us, to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. And as we do it, as often as we do it, we're to do it in remembrance of him. And so this is vitally important. These believers in Acts, just a short period of time after 
The death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus. You know, the time period was very short. All this happened. Jesus ascended into heaven. They went to Jerusalem. They started praying. The Holy Spirit came. The church was birthed and launched. And real quick, we see it did not take them long at all to commit to the fellowship and to commit to doing this in remembrance of Jesus. The Apostle Paul followed up and shared some instructions about the Lord's Supper with us in the Word of God. And in particular, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, he shared some instruction. Now, the instruction initially for the believers of the church in Corinth was corrective because they were making a mockery of the Lord's Supper. They were not receiving the Lord's Supper in a worthy manner. They were not focused in on the remembrance of Christ. They were uh, very haphazardly coming in, many of them drinking all the wine prior to the Lord's Supper, many of them getting uh, drunk. It was chaos. They completely were missing the point. And so Paul corrected them, and he gave us some great instruction as it relates to the Lord's Supper. So I want you to see three points about the Lord's Supper that, that Paul makes real clear here in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. The first is the Lord's Supper is a time of reflection. It's a time of reflection in verse 23. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread. When he gave, had given thanks, broke it and said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after the supper and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The Lord's Supper is a time for us to reflect on, to remember the pain, the ridicule, the humiliation, the suffering Jesus endured as he sacrificed his life on the cross. Please note, Jesus willingly, lovingly, and obediently laid down his life for us. His life was not taken from him. He laid down his life for us in obedience to God, his heavenly Father. Jesus took our place on the cross. He paid our price for sin. We receive forgiveness of our sins by the very blood Jesus shed for us on the cross of Calvary. The innocent convicted as guilty. The righteous one gave his life for us, the unrighteous ones, so that we might be brought back to God. So when we receive the Lord's Supper, we understand from the scriptures, we understand what was going on in that fellowship in Jerusalem. Is it's a time of reflection. But secondly, Paul tells us that the Lord's Supper is a time of examination. Not just reflection, but it's a time of examination. And the reflection opens the way to the examination. We continue in verse 27. So then whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sin against the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself in this way. Let him eat the bread and drink from the cup. For whoever eats and drinks without recognizing the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. The Lord's Supper, as we reflect on the cross, as we reflect on the sacrifice of Jesus, it's also a time of examination for you and me. Our reflection leads to our examination. It's a time for us to examine ourselves. It's a time for us to spend time with the Father and we ask God to reveal to us any sin that is unconfessed in our lives so that we might confess them. It's a time where we ask the Holy Spirit of God to search our hearts and our minds and to see if there's anything offensive in us and then to lead us in the everlasting way. And we do this out of 
this desire that comes from our time of reflection. Our time of reflection increases our desire and willingness for examination. But we also do this because we want to receive the Lord's Supper in a worthy way. We don't want to be guilty. I know I don't. I'm sure you don't. When we read these words in totality, there's some warning in these words. We don't want to receive the Lord's Supper in an unworthy way. So reflection and examination is a must. Receiving the Lord's Supper in an unworthy way. What, 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 does, that, what does that mean? Well, it means a few things. One, it means receiving the Lord's Supper apart from a relationship with God by God's grace through faith in Christ Jesus. The Lord's Supper is a fellowship family meal among brothers and sisters in Christ. Those of us who are new in Christ Jesus, as we remember his sacrifice and as we renew our commitment to him. And so for those who are still on the journey to God, for those who have yet to surrender their lives to God and received his gift of salvation by faith, faith and trust in Jesus, it's an act of worship that's best not participated in by those who are still on the journey. But we see as well, receiving the Lord's Supper in an unworthy way would also be for those of us who claim the name of Christ by doing it with unconfessed sin in our lives. By holding on to bitterness, resentment, unforgiveness, anger, whatever the sin may be, worry, stress, whatever. We need to examine ourselves. We need to allow the Holy Spirit to examine us and to search our hearts. And we need to examine and listen because if the Holy Spirit brings up sin in our lives that we've not confessed, we need to confess it. We need to confess it so we can receive his forgiveness so that we can move forward to receiving it in a worthy way. A third way to receive it in an unworthy way is just to go through the motions. To not take it seriously. To just flippantly take the bread and drink the juice and then just go on. We've checked that box. We've done our duty. We've hit that ritual and now we can go on about our way. No, no, no. Paul said, if we come to this bread and cup without recognizing the body, if we're going through the motions, if we're not taking time to reflect, and if we're not allowing that reflection to produce examination, we're missing the point. And so when we receive the Lord's Supper as our fellowship in Jesus, we focus on Jesus, we focus on his sacrifice, we confess any sin that the Holy Spirit convicts and brings up in our lives, and we ask God to forgive us of that sin. We seek forgiveness from others if it's needed. We show forgiveness to others if it's needed. We forgive ourselves when it's needed. Oftentimes, God's forgiven us long ago of sin and decisions that are part of our past that we have yet to truly embrace his forgiveness because we're too busy holding on to shame, the regret, the pain that we caused. This examination allows us time to to fix our eyes on Jesus, to give thanks to Jesus for his sacrifice for us. And it also is a wonderful time prior to receiving the bread and the cup. It's a great time to place our faith and trust in Jesus as our Savior and our Lord. It's a great time. And therefore, there's always an opportunity to respond to the gospel as we look to the Lord's Supper because there's always a time to receive that gift of salvation of placing your faith and trust in Jesus, acknowledging that Jesus is the Savior, that he did take your place on the cross and pay your price for sin. You believe that though you are a sinner separate from God because of your sin against God, Jesus loved you so much he sent his son to die on the cross for you. 
And Jesus died on the cross. He was buried in the tomb and he rose again on the third day. He's alive. And the way for us to receive that gift of forgiveness and a relationship with God is by God's grace through our response of faith and trust in Jesus. We confess our sin and we ask God to forgive us our sin and we place our faith in Jesus and we trust Jesus and his death, burial, and resurrection for our salvation. We don't trust ourselves or anything we've done or can do or will do. And that we trust Jesus and his death, burial, and resurrection, his work that has been done for us. And therefore, when that happens, if that's you this morning, then in just a few moments, as we receive the Lord's Supper, you'll have an opportunity to share this decision, make this decision with the Lord, and you can receive the Lord's Supper for the very first time as a part of the fellowship of those who claim the name of Christ Jesus. Third, Paul told us that the Lord's Supper is also a time of proclamation. It's a time of proclamation where we get to proclaim the good news of the gospel. We see in verse 26, he said this, Paul said, for as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim, say that with me, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So when we receive the Lord's Supper, it's a time of proclamation. We've had our reflection. We've had our examination. And now we have our time of proclamation. We proclaim the good news of the gospel on the Lord's Supper. We proclaim the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ. We proclaim his burial and resurrection. We proclaim the forgiveness that we have in Christ Jesus by the blood he shed for us on the cross. We proclaim the victory that is ours over sin, Satan, and death by faith and trust in Jesus Christ. We proclaim the return of Jesus Christ and our eternal home with heaven one day that is waiting on us. It's time of proclamation. It's time of celebration. The Lord's Supper is a time of celebration where you and I, as family members, as part of the fellowship with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, we celebrate the fact that God has rescued us from the domain of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son He loves. We celebrate our forgiveness in Christ Jesus. What a joy, what a privilege. The Lord's Supper. And so we, this fellowship, you and I, food is a part of our fellowship. We enjoy eating meals together. I think we understand this. We enjoy fellowship meals. We enjoy friendship meals. We enjoy family meals. We enjoy, and most often in our church fellowships, but even most often, we enjoy those meals in our life teams, week in and week out around the table. But we also enjoy receiving the Lord's Supper. So we see that food is a part of fellowship. Second point he makes is prayer is a part of fellowship. He said they devoted themselves to prayer. This was a praying church. These believers, Luke told us, they were continually united together in prayer. They prayed all the time. They prayed by themselves. They prayed for themselves. They prayed with one another. They prayed for one another. They prayed over one another. They prayed as they were going to the temple. They prayed as they were coming back from the temple. They prayed in their homes. They prayed wherever they went. They prayed for the sick. They prayed for the scared. They prayed for the struggling. They prayed for the suffering. They prayed for the stress. They prayed and gave thanks to God for all his blessings. And they prayed and gave glory to God for his grace, his goodness, and his greatness. And prayer... As a part of our fellowship, we pray because God wants us to pray. God has told us to pray. God told Jeremiah and us, call to me and I will answer you and tell you great and unsearchable things you do not know. Jesus said, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open. For the one who asks receives, the one who seeks and finds, and the one who knocks, the door will be open to him. Paul said we're to pray at all times and all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests and we're to always keep on praying for all the saints. We're to pray without ceasing. I think we get the point. God wants us to pray. We need to pray. We are not created. We're not meant. We're not made. We're not called to do life on our own because we can't. But prayer is this privilege. It's this power source that we receive that helps us to walk in our victory in Christ Jesus. Prayer helps us to walk by the Spirit and not the flesh. Prayer helps us to walk in the wisdom that is ours, the truth of God's Word. And so we see prayer focuses our minds on God. Prayer 
allows us to cast our cares on God. Prayer allows us to get fresh air from God. Prayer fills us with the peace of God, which guards our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Prayer reminds us that God is with us, watching over us, and he's working at us according to his good purposes for us. We pray because we know God hears and answers our prayers according to his will for us, which is best for us. And so two of the more prominent disciplines that are a part of the fellowship, that are part of being relational, and that are part in there from the inside of the fellowship that then helps us to move to the outside, which we'll talk about uh, in a week or two, is the Lord's Supper and prayer. The third point we see here is Jesus is the priority of fellowship. Jesus was the priority of this church. He was the priority of their fellowship. Their eyes were on Jesus. Their preaching and teaching was about Jesus. They were living and loving like Jesus. Jesus is a priority for our church fellowship. Our eyes are on Jesus. Our preaching and teaching is about Jesus. We're seeking to live and love like Jesus by his power at work in our lives. The Lord's Supper reminds us of the sacrifice Jesus made to unite us together as part of the fellowship with him and through him with our Heavenly Father. Prayer reminds us of the sacrifice that Jesus made that opens the way for us to communicate with God. The ways in we pray in the name of Jesus is we have access to God through Jesus. So we're always praying in the name of Jesus because there's no other name to pray in than the name of Jesus. Because there's no other way to get to God than through Jesus. And we know that our fellowship reminds us the sacrifice of Jesus that he made to unite us together as brothers and sisters in Christ. So that means our lives are about Jesus, our homes are about Jesus, our meals are about Jesus, our ministries are about Jesus, our life teams are about Jesus, our small groups are about Jesus, our preaching is about Jesus, our teaching is about Jesus, our relationships are about Jesus, our work is about Jesus, our worship is all about Jesus. So let's continue to fix our eyes on Jesus Christ, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. He scorned its shame and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Let's continue to consider Jesus who endured opposition from sinful men so that we today will not grow weary, so that we will not lose heart. Hey, it's always the right time to look to King Jesus, amen? It's always the right time. When we're on the mountaintops, when we're in the valleys, when we're at every step and stage in between, it's always the right time to look to Jesus. It is a privilege for us to pray that was purchased for us on the cross. So let's make sure we don't take the privilege of prayer for granted. It's a privilege for us to receive the Lord's Supper this morning. To remember Jesus and his incredible, outrageous sacrifice for us. His immeasurable explosion of love for us in obedience to his Father. so that we might be able to say we are family. We have fellowship with God and we have fellowship with one another in King Jesus. Let me ask you to bow in prayer. We're gonna receive the Lord's Supper here in just a moment, but before we do, we're gonna take some time for prayer. I think it's only fitting that we walk in the Word this morning, so that's what we're going to do. Our prayer partners will be standing here at the front, and uh, they would love to pray with you and pray for you. The altar is open as it always is. We're going to move into a time of prayer. We're going to move into this time of reflection and examination. And so we're wanting to make sure that as we prepare our hearts and minds to receive the Lord's Supper, we're going to do it in a worthy way. So we don't want anyone carrying any burdens, cares, concerns that may have been weighing you down as you entered this room. That's why our prayer partners will be standing here. They'd love to pray with you, pray for you. They'd love to pray over you. They'd love to help lift that burden and give it to the Father so that peace can replace 
that burden in your life. Husbands, you may want to grab your wife's hand. You may want to kneel right there where you're seated. You may want to come to the altar. Family, sisters in Christ, you may want to grab a sister's hand. Men, you may want to grab a brother's hand. You may want to just come and kneel at the altar. You may just want to come and just take this time of reflection and examination. Maybe you just want to kneel right there where you're seated. Maybe you just want to turn and take a knee and just bow in the Lord's presence. Take this time to reflect on the sacrifice of Jesus. Reflect on how he loved you so much that he took your place on the cross. He paid your price. He willingly gave himself for you. Reflect on all that he endured on your behalf. Ask God to speak to you, to convict and bring up and reveal any sin in your life so that you can confess it, forsake it. Give those burdens, those cares to the Lord. If you need help, we'd love to pray with you, pray for you. Put your eyes on Jesus. Listen, if you have never made that decision, but as we've talked about the gospel, you want to give your life to God right now. You want to receive God's gift of salvation and place your faith in Jesus. Then I want to encourage you, be courageous right now while everyone else is seated, heads bowed, praying, spending this time of reflection, examination. Come up forward. We'd love to introduce you to Jesus. We'd love to receive the Lord's Supper with you for the very first time. This is an opportunity for us to spend this time. We're going to take a few moments. As you continue to pray, our men are going to come forward now and they're going to take the Lord's Supper, the elements, and they're going to spread out into four different positions in this worship center. And in just a moment, I'm going to read a scripture again and I'm going to say a prayer, a blessing over the bread and the juice and when I say this prayer we're going to encourage you once you're ready you've had your time of 
reflection and examination. We'll encourage you to step forward and make your way to the nearest set of men and receive the elements, the bread and the juice for the Lord's Supper. You may want to take the elements back to your seat. You may want to come up here and line the altar as so many times families do together. You may want to go and stand over to the side and receive the Lord's Supper together as families, as brothers in Christ, as sisters in Christ. Maybe this morning it's just you and the Lord and you want to come and kneel and receive it here. As the Lord leads, you respond to him in obedience. As you receive the elements and as you move to where the Lord's leading you, you receive it, the bread first and then the juice. If you're physically unable to make your way to where these men are standing, then if you want, you can just simply raise your hand and we will come and we will serve you where you are seated. I want to encourage each of us, as we've seen once again in the scriptures this morning, to make sure that we receive it in a worthy manner. If you're on your journey to a relationship with God, then I encourage you in these moments just to allow the Lord to speak to you about his love for you and the Savior that he sent to down the cross for you, King Jesus. Ask God to continue to reveal himself to you. As we worship now by receiving the Lord's Supper, and we invite anyone who's claimed the name of Jesus Christ to receive this Lord's Supper with us, to worship as part of our fellowship with God and with one another this morning. Again, Paul wrote, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you on the night when he was betrayed. The Lord Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper and said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Almighty God, we thank you for Jesus. Seems so insignificant, these words, in comparison to the sacrifice he made for us. And yet, Father, we just say thanks for the joy, for the privilege, for the beauty that we have to be part of your family, to have fellowship with you and with one another. And we acknowledge today that that fellowship, as always, is by your grace through our faith and trust in Jesus. Jesus, his willingness, his obedience to you, God, to come to earth, to live a perfect life, to die a perfect death on the cross. His burial led to his resurrection. He's alive today, and Father, we Take these moments now and we remember the sacrifice of Jesus. The blood he shed for us that provides us with forgiveness of sins. God, as we remember the sacrifice of Jesus, we now renew our commitment to Jesus. God, empower us to walk by the Spirit and not the flesh. God, empower us to walk in our victory in King Jesus. God, as we take this bread, we acknowledge that it's a symbol of the body of Jesus that was given for us. As we drink the juice, we acknowledge it's a symbol of the blood that Jesus shed for us. Thank you, Jesus, for your sacrifice for us. We worship you now as we receive the Lord's Supper together. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen and amen. Let's receive it together.